Hi, I'm Lucy LaCanienta. I'm a research assistant for the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and today I'm here with Gay Strathern. Gay grew up in Australia, and she's now serving as an associate dean for BYU's religious education. And today we'll be looking at a piece by Erika Stenkrona, a Swedish artist, and the piece is entitled Feel the Prints of the Nails in My Hand, and it's here behind us for reference. This piece uses wax crayons, on a mat board and imitation gold leaf, and it was made in 2020. So the scripture block that we'll be looking at today is in 3 Nephi, chapters 8 through 11. Can you tell us, Gay, how this artwork kind of interprets the scriptures that it's based on? Yeah, well, it's mostly based on chapter 11, mm -hmm. right? So where we see the Nephites after the destructions described in chapters 8 through 10, and they've gathered to the temple and while they're gathered there and uh, they start hearing a sound from heaven and they're not really understanding it, they're not tuning in, we don't know why, there could be lots of reasons why that might be the case. Um, and then so they hear something being said, but it takes three times before they're actually understanding uh, the words that they're, they're told. And this is the father saying in verse seven, <clears throat> behold my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear ye him. What's interesting to me with that is that uh, God has uh, announced who this is and then they see this being coming down from heaven, but they still don't understand. Even though they'd heard the words, they didn't understand the significance because they, they think that it is a, um, an angel that is coming down. And so Jesus has to declare once he comes who he is, I, behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified, come into the world. I'm the light and the life of the world. And when the, when the, the multitude who are gathered hear that, they fall down to worship him. Now they're getting a sense mm -hmm. of who he is. And it's in that context then that Jesus invites each of them, one by one, to arise and come forth, verse 14, that ye may thrust your hands into my side and also that you may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and hath been slain for the sins of the world. So that's the context I think behind which uh, we have this, this artwork and I think it's really kind of interesting because in so many ways Jesus coming and showing his, in a resurrected form and showing his hands and feet and still having the marks of the crucifixion is a little bit stunning uh, for Latter-day Saints because mm. we have a very specific view of resurrected bodies. Um, and, and we have Alma uh, talking to his son, speaking of the resurrection, and says specifically, the soul shall be restored to the body and the body to the soul Yea, and every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored in their proper and perfect frame. So the question is, why hasn't Jesus' body been perfected? Why is he still carrying the marks of the crucifixion uh, with him, which is so prominent here? Clearly, mm -hmm. I think in Third Nephi 11, he wanted, he needed to have them for... Um, uh, for the people to introduce themselves. And uh, uh, of course, in the New Testament, we see similar things happening in Luke's gospel, the account of the resurrection and in John's mm -hmm. gospel with Thomas, lest I see and touch and feel, I'm not going to believe kind of thing. So this then becomes kind of a, a really important question of why we're seeing the resurrected Jesus with these marks in his in his hands that the author, the artist here is trying um, to convey and I think that there's there's one answer that um, this could be um, so for example in Zechariah and of course I didn't look that at one beforehand but in Zechariah 13 6 we have this passage and says and one shall say unto him what are these wounds in thine hands and he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Um, and then Doctrine and Covenants 45 verses 51 and 52 is an interpretation of that Zechariah passage. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? And then shall they know that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So they're quoting the Zechariah, yeah. Zechariah passage. Now, that makes sense to me, right? Um, they had no idea who he was, even when God declared that his son was coming. Mm -hmm. But it was Jesus saying, no, no, I'm not an angel. I am Jesus Christ, and let me prove it to you. Mm -hmm. So prove it to you by coming and touching and feeling and seeing these, uh, these marks of the crucifixion. That's wonderful. Thanks yeah. for providing us with that context on the stigmata and how the artist uses it here to show the wounds of the crucifixion. Okay, can I be a little bit um, uh, technical here? Mm -hmm. So stigma, stigmata is uh, a term mostly used in Catholic theology, mm -hmm. but it's not usually used to describe the marks in Jesus' hands and feet. Okay. It's used to, be, to reflect the marks that uh, Christians have mm -hmm. um, that reflect. And I think it's coming, from, well, I'm not thinking, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. It's coming from Galatians um, chapter 7. Oops, where is, I should know where to find Galatians. Uh, verse 17, where Paul writes, From henceforth... Let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks, and there's the mm -hmm. word stigmata, yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know what the marks are here with Paul. Mm -hmm. I think with Paul, he might be talking about the thorn in the flesh. But in Catholic tradition, it is starting with St. Francis of Assisi in about 1212 AD, um, people are having a kind of a mysterious, ecstatic experience where they're getting marks in the same place mm -hmm. as the Saviour's crucifixion marks. And that's to represent a union with yeah. him. And I think that that's a really important concept. Yeah, that is. Thank you. I think this piece gives us an interesting juxtaposition between its simplicity and the complex destruction that we see in the chapters described before. Um, can you contextualize this artwork for us in terms of a larger LDS artwork tradition and context. Yeah, I think that there's some, uh, some really nice things going. I'm not an artist, right? So I don't know artist stuff. Mm -hmm. I know some theology, right? And that's so that, great. That's we probably love that too. The, the context that, that I'll give. And some of it we've already um, talked about here in terms of the resurrection and having a... a marks in a resurrected body. Mm -hmm. But I also think here there's just some lovely stuff going on here when um, I like in 3rd Nephi 11, not just 14, um, but going on to 15. So lots of people long before me have argued that if the people at the temple and later on 3rd Nephi they tell us that that's 2,500 people. Right. If they were spent just 10 seconds with Jesus and touching and feeling, and these are really intimate mm -hmm. touches, right? Then Jesus stood there for around seven hours. Wow. Now, if we're not careful, we could miss that because we're going to read these verses in like less than a minute. Mm -hmm. But what does that tell us about how important this is for the Saviour, that he was willing to spend that much time. And, and the fact that they came for, and I want to read verse 15, and it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into the side and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and his feet. And this they did going forth one by one until they had all gone forth and did see with their eyes and did feel with their hands and did know of a surety and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. Right? All throughout the Book of Mormon, we've had prophets talking about that the Messiah would come and visit us, that we are also part of the covenant people. Um, and this was a, a way for them to know and have their own personal witness. It was important that Jesus, for Jesus, that each of these people didn't just have God declaring, this is my beloved son. Mm -hmm. As important as that really, really was, right? 
He didn't want them just to have a group understanding of who this Jesus was. He wanted each one to have their own personal experience with the Saviour so that they, their, their witness was not relying on anyone or anything else, but it was their personal experience. And I love the fact that he allowed them to come by one by one, that Jesus wants each of us individually to have a testimony of Christ and who he is, independent of uh, what our parents, their testimony, independent of my, my friends, independent of my community, maybe even even though this might be a little jarring, even independent of the prophet, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because I will be judged by my witness and what I do, not what other people say and, 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 and testify to me. As important as those things are mm -hmm. to help me have the desire to do it. But I've often wondered, so how do I get my one-by-one -one experience with the Saviour? Yeah. Um, I, I can't even imagine what this must have been like for these people. Um, I would have loved to have been there, right? To, to have that experience and to know personally who he was. Um, and how would that impact me? How would that make a difference in my life? How would that make a difference um, in my relationship with him? And so I have all of these, and that's what I think the artist here is trying to do, right? Absolutely. Is that she doesn't show the 2,500 people. Mm -hmm. She shows one person who is coming and having this very, very intimate, personal experience uh, with, with the Saviour. And I think that that's just uh, really beautiful. But then as I'm thinking about that, why do they get it and I don't get it? <laughs> why, why can't I have been there? And then I think back to um, Thomas's experience in the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he wasn't there on the first time Jesus arrived. And when everybody tells him that, uh, uh, dude, you missed out, right? You should have been at church that day. You missed out on something really important. And his response, except I see and feel and touch, I'm not going to believe. And honestly, I don't think he's just talking about him. In some respects, I, I think he's... Mm -hmm. uh, emblematic of all of the apostles, right? They had the experience, but he didn't. But if they wouldn't have been there, I think that they probably would have been a little bit like yeah. Thomas. But it's also about me. And so you can imagine him, right, the next Sunday he's there and Jesus come and he goes, Thomas, yeah, come here. I said, oh. And then blessed are those Thomas who have not seen and yet believed. And that's me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that experience in Third Nephi, but... I've got to find a way to have that personal one-by-one -one experience with the Saviour until such time when he comes again and we're told that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall declare that he is the Christ, the Son of God. So in some ways this, might, this artwork might be re representing something in Third Nephi in a way of looking at it, but in another way it's representing what all of us will do ultimately when yeah. he comes again. Well, that's beautiful. I love how this piece really is a testament to that individual relationship that Christ wants with each of us and that he wants us to have with him. Can you share your personal reaction to this artwork and the scriptures that we've talked about today? Yeah. <clears throat> when I look at, thank you for, for asking me to do that and to think about it, right? Yeah. Because that, that's been a, a lovely experience for me as Good. I've contemplated this. As I look at this picture, again, knowing that I know nothing about artwork, but there's two things, I think maybe three things that stood out. This woman represents all of us and more specifically for me, it represents me. Um, it represents me kneeling before him and me thinking about what would I do if I had 10 seconds with him, how would I react? It represents me looking at those, um, those marks in his hands and his arms and the realization that they're there not because of anything he did, but because of what I did, right? Mm -hmm. He's kept them in his 
resurrected body to remind me of what I've done. And in some ways I see this that the artist has specifically chosen to paint this woman in red. Right? Um, the book of Revelation tells us that when Jesus comes again and he's with his armies in heaven on earth to defeat Satan in his um, his army that he will come in red clothes and those clothes have been uh, a red because of the sacrifice he made as the Lamb of God right but in a way I see these clothes as and especially as the young woman is kneeling there with him I, I, I don't know what the artist is thinking but for me it's saying it's my sins. This red represents my sins. And it's, it's, it's that that caused the Saviour to go through and, and to have experience all that he experienced in Gethsemane on the cross were because of me. And that's a reminder. The red reminds me of that. Mm. But the other thing that uh, it's a reminder of um, is that in a number of places in the Book of Mormon, it talks about that how our garments will be made white through his blood and through his sacrifice. And that's kind of a little weird thing for me because there's not too many things that I put in the wash with red dye that come out white, right? No. So it's, it's, it's telling me this is kind of meant to be a bit of a jarring thing. How mm -hmm. can blood, how can whatever make things white, that's not what we're doing, but with the power of Christ. So it, it, it represents me coming before the Lord, knowing not that my garments will stay red, but that because of the, the sacrifice evidenced by um, these prints, um, that, that my clothes, my garments can be made white and in, in the book of Revelation white is the sign of victory. I also can have victory over death. I mm -hmm. also can have victory over my sins and my inadequacies and my weaknesses and my fears and, and all of the things that become a part of life because of what is depicted in this, in this painting. And that's, that's, that's always good mm -hmm. for me to remember that. Absolutely. That's wonderful and just a lovely and very powerful interpretation for yeah. each of us to yeah. think about. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I have one other thing that I want to finish that off with. Please do. So there's this great uh, quote by Elder Holland and he's talking about the crucifixion. Because I see the signs of the crucifixion are a symbol of God's love for me. Mm -hmm. Right? And then Elder Holland says this and I love, love this quote. And I'm quoting... When we stagger or stumble, he is there to steady and strengthen us. In the end, he is there to save us. And for all this, he gave his life. However dim our days may seem, they have been a lot darker for the Saviour of the world. As a reminder of those days, Jesus has chosen, even in a resurrected, otherwise perfected body, to retain for the benefit of his disciples the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. Signs, if you will, that painful things happen to the pure and the perfect. Signs, if you will, that pain in this world is not evidence that God doesn't love you. Signs, if you will, that problems pass and happiness can be ours. It is the wounded Christ who is the captain of our souls. He who yet bears the scars of our forgiveness, the lesions of his love and humility, the torn flesh of obedience and sacrifice, these wounds are the principal way we are to recognize when he comes again. And I love that because it gives me hope that in an, as an imperfect being, who makes so many mistakes and is not perfect in the sense that we often think of perfected. But even in that, 
God's love is there and it's manifest. That he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son. If I can just begin to believe in him and understand him, then I have hope in this very difficult world mm -hmm. um, of what is possible for me in an eternal perspective. And I love that. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for bringing that quote in. I love how it ties in. And thank you for spending your time with us today and for sharing your insights on this piece and on the scriptures that we've discussed today. Thanks, Lucy.